My name is Ingrid Mary Percy, and I'm a visual artist. I'm currently living and working in Corner Brook, Newfoundland, and I teach at Memorial University. Um, but prior to that, I've been living here in Victoria, BC since 1995. Came over here um, in 95 to do my master's, my MFA at the University of Victoria. Um, and I studied, I primarily came here to study with Robert Yudes, whose work I had seen in Vancouver at the Charles H. Scott Gallery, Emily Carr, where I worked when I was a student. So, um, so yeah, um, I've, uh, I did my undergraduate degree at the Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver. And uh, I studied as a painter, trained as a painter, but I would say fairly early on in my undergraduate degree, probably around third year, I, uh, my practice um, kind of, it changed in a way in that it, it sort of, um, I began to kind of investigate painting in a very conceptual way and sort of think about the conventions and uh, the parameters of painting and looking at painting and two-dimensionality and illusionistic surface and painting as object sort of through other media. So I've kind of continued on that tra trajectory for quite a while. Um, so in my MFA kind of studies, my graduate studies at UVic, I was uh, really interested in working with architectural space and the relationship of the body and the viewer in relation to, in to painting and objects in a space. So um, the work I did at that point, it, I started using actually, you know, um, home decorating materials, um, wood molding and things that directly indexed or connected to architectural space and the domestic. Um, another thing that I'm really interested in is, is modernism and kind of marrying or sort of inserting into these kind of um, modernist abstract kind of tropes, uh, subtexts of, of the vernacular everyday quotidian materials and also kind of feminist sub subtext. So, Often uh, my work will um, will reference domestic space and popular culture, so they're they're kind of like mashups. Um, particular this in, in particular this work, I'm kind of thinking of it as um, as as mashups between abstraction and re representation. I'll talk a little bit about this exhibition here at Polychrome Fine Arts. Um, the title of the exhibition is Squilo, which is a term used in opera to describe a particular quality in a voice. And it, it means steel. So it's, it's kind of this, this resonance um, that you will you would hear you know a, a kind of a, a Wagnerian opera singer singing these incredibly big notes, and she she would have the squealo in her voice, and the squealo it's sort of this this characteristic in the voice that cuts through, right? So um, I titled the exhibition that um, because the past several months I've been taking I've actually been taking opera singing lessons. In, in Newfoundland, um, and it's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, I have this wonderful teacher named Jennifer Matthews. And for me, this work is, is a very kind of, um, it's quite different than a lot of my other work in that it, it's, it's kind of bringing together 
a lot of different aspects and things that relate to my the large my larger life. So, um, so as I was sort of saying earlier, I'm thinking of this work as as a mashup. So, a mashup is you know it's a musical term basically where you know a DJ will take two really different songs and and basically just like mash them together to create a third thing that is is new and different. So it's a, it's a really kind of postmodern idea of kind of taking, of like juxtaposition and collage and taking these two things and, and, and then a third thing kind of coming from those two things or even letting the viewer themselves kind of, um, you know, draw meaning from the relationship between the elements. So, um, so, so in this work, it's, it's, um, it's, it's work that I've made over the past four or five months or so in Newfoundland. Um, and I was able to, um, to use most of the facilities at, at the at Memorial University. I also had a couple of studio assistants for the first time, which was wonderful, two students, Diana Chisholm and Zach Moores, who are wonderful. So, it's a body of actually serigraph prints. So they're silk screen and they're on black paper, white ink on black paper, and then a number of them are also white ink prints on black velvet, blue velvet, and red velvet. Um, the imagery is derived from um, spirograph drawings, spirograph being a, a children's toy. It's basically a mechanical um, drawing t tool. You know, it's supposed to be a toy, but it's, it's basically a, a kind of a drawing tool, a scientific based drawing tool that's very, that was very popular in the 60s and 70s, which was sort of when I grew up. And, and I kind of see the spirograph as being um, a kind of a, of that period in 20th century um, North American culture. It's very indicative of that kind of, of how science and, and structure and um, you know, rational kind of thinking was very prominent. And so I, I really like to use it um, sort of as this motif in this work. Um, I've used that, that before in my work as well, but going back to what this work is, it's those spirograph kind of spirally images mashed together with pop culture um, icons. So um, I have images of Cher from 1972. There's uh, Dolly Parton makes an appearance, um, Elvis, um, and Amy Winehouse. So, and they're all just kind of floating in these um, in these fields. These. So I kind of see Amy Winehouse and the very um, representational kind of pop icons as as this kind of um, you know at one end of the scale of representation they're they're so recognizable and representational that they almost kind of become vacuous again because they they're just like this kind of you know re repetitive image you know that I, I, I appropriated the imagery I pulled it from the internet um, and then the spirograph images are kind of, are very abstract, but they're very evocative as well. They kind of look like cells or flowers or amoebas or just floating shapes. I mean, they're just kind of these things. And then there's a third element that I put in these prints and they're basically the dingbat fonts, um, zap dingbats, which um, I was really interested in using those as a kind of, a halfway point between representation and abstraction because they because they're a font but they're also a picture so I thought it was interesting that they're a, a picture but they actually you know have a, a kind of a uh, uh, they're a language to them a vocabulary so yeah so um, there's about 10 12 pieces in this show the other thing that's in this show there's a couple of of drawings, they're, I call them scroll drawings. Um, they're black charcoal on white paper. They're very graphic, they're highly graphic. In fact, I'd say most of my work is really graphic. I, I you know, I, it's not intentional, but I'm really attracted to a sort of a highly graphic sensibility. So I, I noticed that this work definitely has that quality. Um, 
Yeah, so, the, so these scroll drawings are, um, they're a series that I was working on last year in 20, uh, 2011 here in Victoria in my studio. And they're, they're again, they're, they're based on these kind of doodles where I just start with a line and then I draw the line out and I make it into this kind of three-dimensional abstract scroll image. And then I repetitively kind of keep darkening the lines until it's a very, very graphic scroll image. And when you first look at it, I mean, they sort of, again, they, they look like a thing, but not a recognizable thing. Um, they kind of evoke graffiti um, or some kind of like calligraphy. So again, it's sort of like, for me, it's, it's kind of about code, um, like language, but it's also just about kind of it's that slippage between representation and abstraction, how something can kind of look like it's trying to tell you something or that it symbolizes something or means something, but you're also, you know, just looking at it as the thing in itself. I could talk a little bit about the process of making the pieces. Um, the pro I guess the reason I, I, I'd like to talk about that is because because they are serographs, so they're they're screen prints. Um, they're when people see them, they look like the whole image has been is just one print, but in fact, it's not. It, they're not made that way at all. So. Um, I kind of assumed, um, you know, when I when I had the opening, I assumed that people would kind of be able to look at them and understand the process. But it was it was great that they asked me how they were made because I realized that it's it's way more complicated than than it appears. So the way I made them is I I took um, my sketchbook and I bought a spirograph um, at the, at Zellers, and um, so I made some some drawings. In my in my sketchbook, and I used um, I used a pen that had a like a felt pen tip on it because I wanted it to kind of bleed into the paper. I wanted not not a clean line. I wanted this work to be very much about kind of mistakes and bleeding and breaking down and just kind of you know sort of imperfection. And um, so I made these spirograph drawings in my sketchbook. And I made a whole bunch of them, and some of them were not perfect. So I, um, and then what I did is I photocopied them, it's sort of fairly large, and sort of I enlarged them on the photocopier so that they distorted slightly. And then I made a stencil, various stencils on a screen of these in discrete single elements. Um, so then what I did is I took the, the, the paper and I, I screen printed sort of each, like one element at a time. Um, so each of these prints, they're prints, but they're one of a kind in terms of the composition. So I was sort of using screen print sort of as a drawing tool. Um, yeah, so, um, so a lot of the process is quite intuitive, um, but it is the more you kind of work on it, the more um, sort of skill you develop with any medium. And so with this work, it's, it's that way. Um, I, you know, the work you see here is probably, there was probably about another half or maybe a third to half um, more work that I made, that I edited. So what I did is I made a lot of work and then I, I took, you know, I edited it down to this show.
the, the other thing I was really thinking about with this work was, um, I see it as being like very postmodern, um, and in a way, I, I kind of was, um, I felt like I was um, sort of mining my own sort of visual art practice and history, because the spirograph, um, the white spirograph on black paper I've used before, I did a series of drawings, um, sort of around 2004, 2005, that where I, I used white pen um, spirograph on black paper and I articulated, I, I visualized pathogens using this sort of child's kind of language, right? Child's language meaning the language of a toy, of a spirograph toy. So it was very much about kind of articulating something abstract using very low tech sort of tools and technology and sort of that, again, that gap between representation, like me saying this is, and this is a, this is a representation of anthrax, you know, and then just that gap between a picture of something, a representation of something, and then sort of what it really is, you know, so anyway, so yeah, so with this work, like um, I taught this, this past academic year, 2011-12, at Memorial, it was, it's my first year of uh, teaching there as a, as a tenure track professor. And um, I ended up um, teaching um, silkscreen for the first time. So um, it, was, it was really interesting because it, it is something I've done before, but it was, it was wonderful teaching it. And I just, it's, it's, I've always wanted to use this spirograph imagery um, with screen prints, so I thought with this show I would just try it. So I did. I guess I could talk also about um, the, the velvet. Um, I, in, in my work, I, I've, used, I've used white uh, paint and white, uh, white ink, white drawing on black surfaces a lot. It seems to, it's been a theme that's um, occurred in my work for many, many years, probably maybe t almost 20 years. And I'm really interested in sort of, I don't know why I'm interested in it. I think it's, a, it's just a really um, minimal, you can do a lot with very little. And I love the idea of, you know, of how, how, what's the most you can do with the least, you know? And, and what I mean by that is if you start with a black surface and you add a white, transparent kind of a line or a mark or anything and then you place another let that dry and then place another transparent mark over top of the first transparent white mark when you when you layer them you get a, a third area where the where the white becomes more opaque and suddenly just in that one gesture you're actually um, you are you're making a picture in a way. You're making a, a representation of an object suddenly and space. Um, so I just, I think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm really attracted to that idea of like, again, it goes back to this idea of deconstructing painting and deconstructing like illusionistic space. Like what is the least you can do to kind of create this illusion, right? Which is what painting is, right? It's an illusion illusionistic space. Um, so yeah, so anyway, um, so with this body of work, um, I, I decided to, that I wanted to work on black velvet because black velvet is, it's, it's pretty much like the blackest surface you can find. It, it just completely sucks all the light in. So um, I, I, I started working with black velvet and I really like the idea that it has connotations like major connotations with kitsch um, and black velvet painting. And so I, I did a lot of research into black velvet painting and I was also looking at a lot of artists who predominantly just used black and white in their imagery, like for example, Bourgeois, who's one of my favorite painters of all time. And, uh, you know, and, and of course Malevich as well is, is amazing. Um, so, so I started with the black velvet and, and um, 
I guess I was just playing with that sort of, you know, that balance between, I don't even know if it's a balance, but kind of this pure abstraction, pure formal abstraction and kitsch and just kind of bringing them both together on the same canvas and seeing what would happen and if they could both kind of live together there. Um, but, but they're not super uncomfortable. They're just kind of existing there. So I, I mean, I think the work at first blush, it could seem really accessible because I've been using, um, because I'm drawing these really, these images from pop culture that are, you know, as I said earlier, images of Cher and pop Dolly Parton, um, Elvis. But I think on further, if you spend some time with the work, I personally find it difficult work um, because I think it is not really what it appears to be at first. And um, so I, I, I have had a really interesting kind of relationship with this body of work when I've been making, since in the time that I've been making it. Um, one other thing that um, I, I'd, I'd like to say is that the, 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 the icons, the, the, the celebrities that I've put in the work are all singers. And for me that, um, and also the titles of the pieces are all titles from opera. So um, again, it's very much for me about kind of bringing my own life and my background into the work, um, which is not something, it may not be overt, but for me, this is, this is, you know, that's what I'm doing with this work. That I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, um, you know, kind of bringing art and life together, my own life. Um, I kind of see the, the icons, the more I worked with them, the, you know, the more I, I was looking at pick this image of Elvis and Cher, um, the more I started to see them as characters from my own life, like maybe people that, I've been hanging out with, and so it was really interesting. It's always interesting kind of what work tells you about it, you know. Um, yeah, so, and then the pieces on velvet, they're red and black, so they're white screen prints on red and black velvet. I printed them unstretched on unstretched velvet, and then I built with my, with my studio assistant, we built these, uh, these stretcher frames that have these rounded corners, and we stretch the the um, I, I stretch the velvet onto them. So they're very object-like pieces, um, and yeah. And then there's uh, some works on paper which have a bit more of a graphic quality, just because the ink kind of sits in a different way on paper. And then there's the drawings, and that's about it.